welcome to another Battle of the Port Remastered. This time I'm doing the fourth ever show, Ghouls and Ghosts, otherwise known as Dai Makai Muro. The original video was released way back on August 15th, 2013. Wow, nine years ago. So what is Ghouls and Ghosts? It was Capcom's follow up to Ghost and Goblins and first hit the arcades in Japan on October 5th, 1988. You take control of Arthur the Knight, who must advance through a series of airy levels and defeat a number of undead and demonic creatures in his quest to resurrect all the people killed by Lucifer, including his beloved princess, Prin Prin. Along the way, Arthur can pick up a variety of weapons and armor to help him in his quest. While the core gameplay remains the same as its predecessor, the game now allows Arthur to fire directly upwards and directly downwards while in mid-air. Every now and then the player can cause a treasure chest to erupt from the ground. By firing at the chest, players may uncover new weapons, gold armor or an evil magician that changes Arthur into an elderly man or a helpless duck. The gold armor allows the player to charge up the weapon to release a powerful magical attack. Each weapon has its own special attack. There are six levels. To defeat the game, Arthur must complete levels one through five twice. Upon completing them for the first time, Arthur is taken back to level one, but this time a special weapon appears during the game. To enter Lucifer's chamber, the player must have this special weapon equipped and must have defeated the final fly boss from level five. After entering the final lodge door, the player goes directly to Lucifer's chamber. Can you survive Lucifer and save Princess Primprin? In 1989, Ghouls and Ghosts was ported to a lot of Western home computers with a variety of results. All ports were by Software Creations. So let's start off with the 16-bit ports and the Amiga version. Oh my god, Amiga fanboys cannot possibly even think about defending this crap. There is nothing good about this port besides the reasonable attempt at the graphics. Let's start with the music. Where is the arcade's first stage musical score? Yes, I know what we have here is by Tim Follen and I do have a great deal of respect for a lot of the tunes him and his brother make, but this is not what I want while playing an arcade conversion of a game that had good music. It's as if Software Creations asked Tim to make the music, but he wasn't really feeling like it, so he just dug out some tracks he had saved away on a few floppies. Thankfully, stages two and four do feature remakes of the arcade's musical tracks. Next, let's talk about the gameplay. It's terrible. For a start, the lag in NTSC and PAL modes is unacceptable. Then you have the jump issue, as always, and even when cheating by mapping jump to a button, rather than pushing up, it doesn't help because to shoot upwards on this version, you still jump meaning you end up jumping right into an enemy. I'm sorry Amiga fans, but this is not a good port by any means.
Next up is the Atari ST version, and everything I said about the Amiga release goes for this version too. Well, maybe the lag isn't as bad, since this is running faster, but it is still laggy. All the same issues apply with the gameplay too. Including one that is on the Amiga, which I didn't mention. In the arcade version of the game, you can walk to the left and right, but in this and the Amiga version, you can only walk a few steps to the left until you are met with an invisible wall. How odd. Something else that is odd is in the comments section of this video. You won't find Atari ST fans jumping to the defense of this port, unlike other systems fans. Moving on to the western made 8-bit ports now with the Commodore 64 version. Yet again, this one is a broken mess. Software creations really were pathetic. In this port we have enemies that spawn underneath you while walking, making it 100% impossible to avoid them. You also fall through floors and your main weapon flies over many enemies when it should hit them. The only plus point here is the music, but again, it's the wrong musical score. Now here's a surprise, the ZX Spectrum port is actually very responsive and indeed playable. This was programmed by Matt Folan, and it just goes to show how much better a game is when it is not programmed by monkeys. Sure, Matt has taken a lot of liberties with the level design, but at least we have a game that plays way better than every other port we've looked at so far. In fact, this version was also ported over to the MSX by the homebrew community. Finally, we come to the end of the Western home ports with the Amstrad CPC version. Now, while this isn't as good as the ZX Spectrum port thanks to poorly placed enemies, it is better to play than the other versions so far. The controls are responsible, the animation on Arthur is nice, and the game looks fine. It's just a shame the poorly placed enemies kind of ruin it.
On August 3rd, 1989, we saw the Mega Drive port first released in Japan. This version was programmed by Yuji Naka and is very cut back from the arcade original due to the 5 megabit cartridge size. What you may or may not know is that a homebrew developer under the name of Eimaru has been working on a true arcade port that blows away Yuji Naka's version. Just take a look at his work. Sadly, as of March 2022, no further updates have been shown in video form. Anyway, back to the version that was released. For the time, this was the ultimate version of Ghouls and Ghosts. It plays really well and even improves upon the arcade version by offering 8-way movement. For the purists though, the 4-way movement option is still present. Audio wise, the game is also really good bringing all the classic arcade tunes to the home in stereo. It's just a shame that this version of the game wasn't given an 8 megabit cartridge. Strangely, the Master System port was first released in the States in March of 1990, while it hit Europe over a year later in April of 1991. Developed by Sega and Arc System Works, this version introduces a power-up system that allows the player to enter secret shops and upgrade parts of their armor. This includes helmets, which give the player access to new weapons and magic spells, chest armor, which allows the player to sustain more damage, and boots, which increase the player's speed. NEC's totally pointless upgrade to the PC Engine, known as the Super Graphics, got a port on the 27th of July 1990, and what a port it is! This version is vastly superior to the released Mega Drive version, featuring more colours, more graphical assets, and more arguably better audio. As to be expected, this also plays really well. It is a little tough, but not as tough as the Mega Drive's professional mode. It's somewhere in between that and the Mega Drive's practice mode.
Next up we have the April 1994 release for the Sharp X68000. As to be expected, the X68000 version is basically a pixel perfect port of the arcade game. This is no surprise as it has often been stated that Capcom used X68000 systems to develop their CPS1 games, which is what Ghouls and Ghosts ran on. The audio is slightly different if choosing the internal FM synth, but it is extremely close to the original. The MIDI music option sounds naff in some areas. Not really my thing. As for how this pod plays, well, it is perfect. We even get 6 different difficulty settings, but don't think that will make the game any easier. Even the easiest setting is still a challenge. September 23rd, 1998 saw two releases, one for the PlayStation and one for the Saturn. First we'll take a look at the PlayStation version, which is part of Capcom Generations Dai Sanshi, Koko ni Irakashi Hajimaru, which basically means Capcom Generations 3, this is where the history starts. This collection contains Ghosts and Goblins, Ghouls and Ghosts, and Super Ghouls and Ghosts. The port, as you can see, is very close to the arcade game, but I'm not sure what difficulty setting it is based upon, as it seems a lot more tricky in areas than the arcade version. Sadly, the audio is CD streamed, which means there are pauses between musical tracks as the CD laser searches for the next track. This is only a minor nitpick though. Overall, this is a great port of Ghouls and Ghosts. Just like the PlayStation release, the Saturn version comes on Capcom Generations 3 disc and features all the same games and extras. The Saturn version does run in a different resolution though, giving us a little less space to the sides of the screen compared to the PlayStation and original arcade. This isn't really an issue and something the majority of people wouldn't even notice. Where the Saturn does excel though, is the access time of the music tracks. It's quicker than the PlayStation, giving a much less noticeable pause when music changes. The loading is also quicker, but normally it is the case on the Saturn. Something else I noticed was the color palette. The brightness on the Saturn version seems to match the arcade closer than the PlayStation, which seems a little darker. I did not add any post-processing to either video capture.
And finally, let's take a look at 2007's Java mobile release. Surprisingly, this looks really good. It features graphics from the arcade, nice MIDI renditions of the music and plays reasonably well. The only real downside to this port is the terrible screen snapping. Now maybe this has resolved on some phone models. It's tough to say, but at least here it can be quite off-putting. And let's take a look at all those versions of Ghouls and Goats running side by side. 